Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another week and another session on lifestyle evangelism. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so could one of us please lead us in prayer? Uh, Jafina, is it okay if you can lead us, please? Okay. Uh, Divya, can you lead? Okay. Um, Jafina, yes. go ahead. I'll lead us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful Bible study that we are about to have. God, I pray for everyone who is attending right here. I pray that you fill us with the Holy Spirit and with the knowledge uh, so that we can understand everything that the pastor says. And I pray that you fill him with guidance, understanding, and everything that we learn here. Let us apply that in our life and help us enjoy this life with you and help us to spread the gospel boldly and make heaven crowded. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. All right. So, um, Let's just do a quick recap of what we did last week. Last week, we started on uh, chapter 10, and then we looked at the real battle of winning souls is a spiritual battle, right? Uh, we looked at, you know, the whole aspect of evangelism where, you know, we learned all the practical uh, daily routines that we have to do. That is, you know, the two minute testimony, four minute testimony, the word of God and all of these things that we've learned. The real battle is a spiritual battle because we looked at what the enemy does. The enemy blinds the minds of people. The enemy holds people in bondage uh, and, and the enemy wants to hinder people from receiving the gospel because he knows if these people hear the gospel and if it's something that is um, meaningful and it's sown in good soil he knows that the word of god is able to change lives right so last week we established the fact that the whole aspect of evangelism is a spiritual battle right so even we as leaders we may be in the church uh, leading or in the pastoral team uh, very important. Uh, our personal life will reflect how we will be able to minister to others, right? If we want to, you know, sometimes you may feel, oh, I want to do this. I want to, you know, have this ministry and we have this big vision. That's wonderful. But we have to back that vision up through prayer and intercession, right? Uh, and so every every aspect of evangelism, the real battle is a spiritual battle and the church has responsibilities also um, you the, when i say the church it is you and me which is uh, we pray that god opens doors right and god will do it you know as we pray and seek god god will do it secondly god has given us the authority like god is not saying you know are you sure you want to go against these people and he's not sending us into the battlefield with you know with no weapons He's saying, I have given you the weapons of our warfare. We looked at that also uh, last week, that God has given us weapons that we can use. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, uh, you know, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, this whole armor that we can put on. So God is not sending us into the battlefield saying, okay, go. And if, there's, if, if you can't manage, then just let me know. No. God has given us the authority. He has given us the weapons. And so we as a church have to use that weapon. And then the church as a whole, that is you and me, are to uh, bring change in, in, in the society uh, that we are in. So we stopped there yes, uh, last week. Let's just pick up a little more on this chapter. And then we'll go into chapter 11, which is sowing watering, reaping, and consolidating, right? So before that, let's let's look at this. How do we exercise spiritual authorities? Now, we learned that, you know, we have spiritual authorities. We know that God has given us prayer, intercessory prayer, worship, the word of God, uh, you know, so many weapons. Faith is a weapon. Uh, and so God has given us these weapons. So what is our responsibility as a church, right? How do we exercise, exercise it, right? Now, for example, if we, you know, so for example, physically, if we want to become fit 
in our body and strong. And we say, okay, I'm going to buy all these equipment and I am going to exercise, right? So just an example, right? We buy all the equipment, we have it at home, but we don't really use the equipment. Just picture this, right? So you, we've got all the equipment. It, it's like a gym at home, but we don't use it. It is there. It is available. It's at our disposal. We can use it anytime we'd like, uh, but we don't use it. Well, whose fault is it? It is our fault because it's already there. We're not using it. So God has given us spiritual weapons. God has given us spiritual authority. But we are to use them for God's glory. So let's look at that. First one, when you uh, probably go into a place or, or you're you know, ministering to people, we can establish God's presence through praise and worship. Now, praise and worship is a very powerful, uh, you know, uh, uh, powerful stance that we can take. Right now, praise and worship has very little to do about the music. It's not only about the music; it's part of it. It's part of the you know uh, you know David did that right. He said uh, he formed good teams who could you know uh, 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 play musical instruments and worship the Lord in harmony and unity and all of that. But the real authority is when we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Remember what happened in the encounter with the Samaritan woman? Jesus said, yeah, I know that you guys you all are worshipping, but the time will come when you will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So when we are probably, maybe if we are entering a new city, a new town, a new village, or you're praying for a certain kind of community, maybe the youth, we can make the work of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, uh, uh, be tangible in these places through praise and worship, right? So one of the things that we do in uh, Manglo is we have every month, we have times of praise and worship, right? So every month, every second Saturdays, just come, what we do is we have about, uh, at about 5 p.m., we just have two hours of praise and worship. No preaching, no teaching, nothing. Just praise and worship. What is happening? As we're doing that, we are establishing God's presence in our midst, in our city. And we're also praying for God to open doors for us. Right? So it's, it's a uh, praise and worship brings down the strongholds of the enemy. Picture what happened in the book of Joshua. Right? They've come to this place, they've entered Jericho, and the walls are so great. Now, God could have sent an angel to strike down that wall, or he could have just snapped his fingers and the walls would have come crumbling down. Now, he did that in the past. Remember with Moses, God just parted the seas into two. So the walls was not a big deal. But God told the Israelites, spoke through Joshua, and he said, here's what you do. You walk around those that temple, that, that wall, and every time you walk around it, you praise God, right? And then and the last time you walk around, you shout, you scream, and you uh, lift up a voice of praise, and the walls came crumbling down. And I'm sure you've, we've heard it in a lot of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, maybe sermons and series. We use it synonymous to the works of the enemy. Now, the enemy builds a wall around us, around uh, the people who have been blinded. Sin is like building a wall, right? And so when we praise God, when we worship God, we're bringing down those walls. And God is able, his presence is able to manifest into people's lives. Right. There are plenty of testimonies where people have come to the Lord just through praise and worship, just through singing of a song. So God is able to do that. Second thing that we can do is declare Christ's finished work on the cross for the salvation of those in the city. Right now, 
not only for the city, but even for your friends. So for example, you're ministering to somebody or you have a couple of friends who you want to minister to. This is powerful. You can declare the finished work of the cross over that person, right? Why? Because on the basis of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus and the authority of the name of Jesus, the powers of darkness will be nullified. The work of the enemy will be destroyed, right? I love first uh, in the book, the verse in Colossians, which says, he made a public spectacle of the enemy whom he destroyed, right? He destroyed the enemy. So even as we are ministering to people, you can say, God, let the finished work of the cross, let the power of the cross be, relieved, be released in this person's life. I'm going to go and you know, minister to this person. Now I'm going to go speak to this person. But Lord, let the power of the cross, the authority, the dominion, and the power of your kingdom rule and reign in this person's life and in this person's family. God will begin to do that work. Yes, what's up? We are on page uh, 35. We're looking at exercising spiritual authority to open prison doors. Third point, identify and pull down strongholds, whether it's in people's lives or whether it's in a community or whether it's in a city, right? Now, the enemy has strongholds on people. The enemy has demonic uh, domination over people and over communities, right? And so, what we can do is tear down that veil of blindness over people. So we can pray and say, God, let your light shine. Let your light shine in these places. Right? Lord, this person is in bondage. Let your light shine. Even as I go and share the word, even as I, uh, you know, uh, just go and maybe just uh, share a Bible verse or maybe just a song, let your light shine. In this person's heart declare that the light of God is more powerful than the works of the devil right uh, so this is very important that we do this right and four destroy the works of the evil spirits that are at work in the people's lives right so for example you know uh, corruption murder pornography suicidal tendencies hatred, jealousy, pride, uh, you know, all these things are from the enemy. All these are demonic spirits that are working in people's lives, right? Anger, you know, they, they have you, I don't know if you've met people where the moment you, you know, tell them, hey, can I share about Jesus? They get, they get really angry. They get upset, they just walk out or they uh, hurl abuses and, you know, they just move about. Why? It's not them. It is the spirit, the evil spirit that is causing them to feel uneasy. And so you and I have the authority to destroy the works, the works of the evil spirit in a person's life. We speak against it. Right? Uh, there will be times when people will just hate you because, you know, uh, hate us because we are Christians. Right? For no reason. We may be doing all the good things to them, but they just hate us. Now, it's, remember, it's not the person, but it's the spirit that is working in that person. The mistake that we make is we say, okay, this, uh, you know, this person is, uh, you know, I'm doing all the good things for this person and uh, all I'm getting is hatred, anger, uh, and, you know, why should I go about doing it? Remember that it's not the person. It is the spirit that's working in that person. So you and I are called to destroy the works of the evil spirit that's working in them, right? Uh, <clears throat> I share this once, what happened, we were in uh, uh, Punjab in Ajmer and uh, we were doing a conference, uh, I forget which, I think it was 2012. Uh, we were doing a conference and uh, 
uh, going about the conference. And after a time, we began to just, you know, spend time in prayer, spend time in, uh, you know, uh, uh, just ministering to people. And all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people began to manifest there. Right? Uh, evil spirits began to manifest, just the move of God in that place. There were about uh, 150 of them, pastors and youth. It was a combined thing. And what we noticed was the enemy had such a grip on people, right? And uh, they would they were not willing to, you know, come to a place of, uh, you know, surrendering their lives to God. It was a bondage that was there in them for many, many, many years. So I remember, you know, we as a team, few of us were there. Uh, we just stopped everything. And we began to pray against this working, against the evil spirits that were causing them, uh, you know, to uh, not understand or blinding their eyes, blinding their minds. So we began to pray against it. There was, you know, a lot of chaos because they were all screaming and shouting. And uh, But we were established, the whole team, we were established that God is able to destroy the works of the spirit. A lot of them were delivered uh, that same day and then as the conference went on for a couple of days, a lot of them during the process were being delivered. Right? And I realized that, hey, you know, we are called to speak against the works of the evil spirit into people's lives. Right? Uh, we, we are not to be afraid, oh, what if that and devil comes into me? No, no. Right? Uh, we are covered by the blood of Jesus. We are his children. Right, so we don't have to fear about that. Right, uh, here's another important thing: is uh, we understand our identity, we understand our authority in Christ. So the enemy cannot do anything to us. Right, so just these four points: one, establish, you know, uh, the presence of God through praise and worship; two, declare the finished work of the cross over people, over the lives, over the souls of the people that you are going to minister to. And if you're a pastor, you've got to, you know, declare the work of the cross over the whole community, over the society, uh, uh, over the church members. There's a lot of responsibilities as a pastor. And three, identify strongholds. Right. For example, if you're uh, planning to be an evangelist or, or you're uh, planning to plant a church in a certain place, identify strongholds. Uh, there may be some places where prostitution is something that is uh, very eminent. And there may be some other places where there is you know, drugs and alcohol or, uh, uh, you know, so different ways. The enemy binds people in different uh, strong ways and different strongholds. So identify them and pray against them, right? Suicide. Natural deaths are very common, right? Uh, uh, there was this one place that we went to, uh, and this woman, uh, she was, uh, I think this was in uh, Orissa, if I'm not wrong, uh, and we were in Orissa, and this young woman, she was probably in there in her uh, late 20s, uh, she came up to us and she, she had a prayer. She said that, you know, uh, um, um, uh, uh, I had a child, the baby, and within a few, uh, as as soon as the baby was conceived, a few months, uh, the baby died in the womb. And so they had the second child a, a year later. And the second one also, you know, very, uh, everything was fine. The first scan, the second scan was fine. And all of a sudden, the baby developed some kind of a uh, illness and uh, some infection and the, the baby died miscarriages and so she was so heartbroken she came up to me and she said can you please pray the moment we prayed we just felt that this is not a natural thing right this is uh, a stronghold and so I began to ask her you know what 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 is it what do you do and where do you come from so she told her whole story she was uh, the granddaughter of a you know, a, a priest, a Hindu priest who would uh, involve in, you know, occult uh, and all of this, but uh, very uh, powerfully her father was saved. And, uh, uh, but then this is happening here. So we realized that, hey, it's a stronghold. It's a generational curse that needs to be broken off. And so uh, we prayed, 
pray, praying, we broke off that stronghold. The Holy Spirit was able to minister to her. Uh, and it was a blessing to see her also have a child later on, a healthy child. So, so at times, we need to target or we need to hit the nail on the head. Uh, we need to find out. Uh, you know, that's why in evangelism, it's very important to ask questions. Right? Ask questions. Find out what is the reason. What is the, what is the source? What what could have happened that has caused this? You know, sometimes we may not understand what the reason is, uh, but if we dig deep, we may, you know, get some kind of an idea, and then our prayers can be directed towards that. Right. So uh, let's get into chapter eleven. This is a very uh, important aspect, but. It, is, it applies to each of our lives. Right? I'm sure all of us have heard of this. Sowing, watering, reaping, and consolidating. Right? So let's just briefly look at each point. Right? Before that, let's read John chapter 4, verses 35 to 38. John chapter 4, verses 35 to 38. Yes, could one of us please read that? John chapter 4, 35 to 38. Yes, Jeffina, if you're able to, can you please read? Can I, can I read? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Divya. Go ahead. John chapter 4, right, Pastor? John chapter yes. 4. Yeah. John chapter 35 4, to 35 to 38. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So here, the Lord Jesus is, you know, in a nutshell, he's giving the whole essence of sowing, watering, and reaping. All right, let's also read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 10. First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 10. For okay. when one says... Uh, sorry, Rosalind, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 4 to 10. Yeah, sorry, 3, 4 to 10. Yes, go ahead. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so that Neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So here we see Paul is writing to the Corinthians and we know the reason. There is division within the church. Right? Just to put a context on this. Paul started the church. Then he sent Apollos, who was a great teacher, to go and minister to the people there. And so when Apollos went, many people came into the church, right? And then after that, uh, some of the Jews came into the church, right? So meaning they, they also accepted the work of Jesus Christ. And so now we've got three kinds of people here. First, 
the you know, we could say the core team who's who was there from the time the church was established to when apollos came through apollos another group of people entered the church and then there were the jews who you know accepted uh, the gospel and entered into the church now one is saying i believe in paul so he was he came here first he ministered and we accepted his gospel two another group of people are saying hey we believe in apollos we don't we haven't seen paul yet we've heard of him but we believe apollos because apollos came and ministered to us he shared the gospel and we came to uh, know christ and then three there were the jews who said hey actually the main leader of the church is peter who's sitting in jerusalem so you got three people with three different ideas right one says i follow paul one says i follow paulus one says i follow cephas which is peter and so paul writes and he says listen it's not about that god uses one person to sow one person to reap and another person to receive the harvest right and so let's look at the first one sowing what is what is the meaning of sowing sowing simply means you take a seed in natural terms you take a seed you put it into the ground and you wait and then the seed germinates and it bears fruit right it uh, sowing basically means the lifetime of a seed i'm sure most of us have heard this right what you sow is what you reap right uh, if we if we sow apples or oranges we, we we're going to get apples or oranges right so what you sow is what you reap galatians 6 7 right so sowing implies the whole aspect of waiting right remember nothing happens overnight right you take a seed right you put it into the ground the germination of that seed is not going to happen overnight some seeds take probably two months some take six months some takes a year and so sowing implies a waiting period right now what is what is important in the sowing process is also look for good ground now you don't look at a farmer and you say okay he has some seeds and he goes into his uh, ground and he doesn't you know he looks for the best patches of land where he can sow these seeds right now if he's not a good farmer may, maybe he's just in a hurry or he just wants to do something okay i've got this thing i have to do it he's just going to take those seeds and just throw it anywhere he likes and then they're just going to be there on the ground some will harvest some may not harvest so here's the thing a good farmer sows and looks for good ground to sow his seed right and once he does that he waits eagerly for the seed to germinate to come forth right now in the sowing process uh there's there's something called as a waiting time right i'm sure we've all heard this right preparation time is never wasted time right god makes his people wait moses waited joseph waited apostle paul waited and so that waiting period is a powerful time right and and so as we sow be patient right uh be patient continue to uh, you know look at that seed continue to have faith in that seed right it's not like you know the farmers of you know they put seeds everywhere uh, it's not like they've lost faith in their uh, in their seeds that they've sown they they trust that hey one day this is going to germinate it's going to become big and it's going to uh, uh, i'm going to reap a good harvest out of these uh, out of this whole uh, uh, labor that i'm doing so faith is implied when we sow right each one of us when we are sowing into people's lives when we are sowing in the ministry when we are sowing into god's kingdom right have faith that god is able to bless it right now when i say you know now nowadays the term sowing has only been you know targeted towards money and it's not so it's not at all only about money right uh 
uh, sewing involves many things. For example, if I am working, I'm a working professional, and every Saturday I want to go and serve in the church, I want to do something. What am I doing? I'm sowing seeds in my own life, saying, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm sowing seeds in my life. I believe that one day it will bear fruit in my life. So it's not only to do with money. So for another example would be if we are reading the word of God, right? Uh, in our free time, we are reading, you know, maybe for half an hour, and then we move it to one hour. What are we doing? We are sowing the seed of God into our heart, right? And we believe that it will bear fruit because what we sow is what we reap. If we sow anger, we sow jealousy, hatred, and all these aspects, we will reap that. But if we sow love, faithfulness, gentleness, the fruit of the Spirit, we sow this in our lives and even in people's lives, we will reap that. Right? So very important, look for good ground to sow your seed. Right? Remember the parable of the sower in Matthew 13? The man went about, he put a seed, some fell on thorny ground, some fell on stone, some fell on uh, good ground. Right? And, and, and what happened? He gives an explanation. The ones that fell on good ground was able to bear fruit. The ones on thorny grounds was just crumpled away. It didn't. It was There was no solid foundation there. The ones that fell on stone didn't really last long as well. So, as we sow into God's kingdom, right? Remember, the moment you, uh, you know, you're, you're speaking to somebody about Jesus, picture this in your mind. You're taking a seed, you're sowing it in their hearts, right? Uh, you're sowing it in their hearts. You will reap the benefits, right? You will reap what, uh, what, what, whatever, whatever you're doing. You're, you're sowing into God's kingdom. God will help you to reap out of it, right? Another important point here is the more you sow, the more you will reap. Right? The more you will sow, the more you will reap. Right. Uh, yes. So as uh, I just wanted to mention this, it was mentioned in chapter 11. Yes. So what we are doing is uh, we just have, you know, uh, we are, this is a draft. We are still building on the notes. So uh, maybe next semester, the notes will be completed. And so we, we what we can do is we can, you know, uh, send you the copy of that as well. So for now, uh, we're just building on the notes. So maybe if you'd like, you can probably take notes as well. Uh, but maybe by next semester, the notes should be uh, completely updated, right? So just follow along. First one was sowing. Second one is watering. Now, watering is what? Uh, is something to do with follow-up, with caring for people. Right now, picture this, right? If you and I have shared the gospel with somebody, we need to follow up with them, right? A, a farmer puts the seed into the ground. He doesn't, uh, you know, go to his house and look at that ground and say, okay, when are you going to come? When are you going to come? No. I think the first thing he's going to do, he's going to wake up in the morning. He's going to water that whole place. He's going to make sure that there's no, you know, pesticides or uh, there's no, uh, you know, thorns or thistles growing around that side. He's going to water that place. Now, why is he watering it? Because he knows if he puts the water to that, he needs to care for that plant. And when you put water to that, only then the seed is going to germinate. If you don't do it, the whole aspect of sowing the seed will go to waste. right? And so watering is basically caring for the plant. And so even in ministry, and even as we as pastors and leaders, uh, we get opportunities to minister to people, remember to care for your people. They are not projects, right? People are not projects. People are God's children, and we need to care for them, right? Uh, what, does he, what does he do? He also not only waters, but he goes about after maybe a couple of weeks, he will go and he will check whether there are weeds growing in, right, thorns or thistles, and he will, the farmer will cut it off, 
Remember the whole example where Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, right? Uh, if you've seen the vine, uh, the, 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 you know, the weeds grow in between the plants, right? In, in between the vine press. And it is, you know, very subtle the way it grows. But if it's not looked at, those weeds get the strength to pull down the whole wine press, right? So it's very important for a wine dresser to go and to make sure those weeds are cut off when they are small itself, right? Otherwise, it's going to be a problem, right? So basically, watering is to look after, right? To look after what you have sown. It is your seed. You have sown it. Look after it. Right, uh, the word water is synonymous to even the word of God. Hebrews four twelve talks about the power of God's word. He says, the "Word of God is powerful, sharper than a double edged sword, penetrates every bone marrow. It touches our heart." Acts chapter twenty and verse thirty two talks about. Uh, you know how the word of God is able to build us up. It gives us an inheritance. So when we are watering the seeds that are sown, we are looking after it. Right now, imagine a farmer. He's sown the seed, but he's too lazy to go and water the plant. What are those seeds? He says, "Okay, I'll do it tomorrow, or I'll do it after two days. I'll do it after a week." And then maybe after a week, he goes and waters it. What's going to happen? He said, hey, no, no, no. You should put water the next day. Uh, because of his laziness or because of his, uh, you know, the, maybe his busyness, whatever it is, he missed out on the seed that could have been sown and a harvest that could have been reaped. And so watering is very important. Now, Let's put it into context. Now, for example, we've uh, shared the gospel with somebody, right? What we can do is send them a Bible verse, send them a message, say, them, hey, uh, I spoke to you about this. What do you feel? How, or did you, were you able to understand it? Is there some questions that you have? You're just following up. And then the water, the word of God, what does it do? It purifies, it nourishes, it strengthens. Right. So remember, uh, you know, uh, even uh, as you are in the church, or you're, you know, maybe ministering to somebody, a friend of yours, remember to water the seed that you have sown. Right. Third one is reaping. The word reaping simply means to cut and to gather the harvest. Right. So the farmer has sown the seed. He's done his part of watering it, looking after it, cutting away the weeds. Now comes the time of reaping the harvest. Right? It basically means to gather the harvest together, to get returns or to get profits. Right? And so here it goes. What you sow is what you reap. Let's look at this example of Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was a good young boy. His brothers were so jealous of him. And we know the story. They threw Joseph into a, a sold him on to slavery. And um, everything went wrong in Joseph's life. But here's what he did. He said, I will never dishonor the name of God. Right? And even when, you know, uh, uh, that woman made advances on him, Pharaoh's wife, it, it didn't really, you know, he, he decided, you know, how can I go against my God? Right? The seeds in his life that were sown were good seeds on good ground. Now picture this. What if Joseph had bitterness in his heart? Imagine he's in prison there. He says, I didn't do anything wrong. God, why is this happening to me? Why? Firstly, you said I'm going to be a great person and now I'm sold as a slave. I'm in Egypt. They have put me in prison and now I've been uh, accused of uh, some wrong thing that I uh, haven't even done. Uh, why is all these things happening to me? There's no account of that. Joseph was only only had good seed in his heart for God. He said, no, I know that God is in control. I know that 
uh, God will take me out of this trouble, trouble time. Was it difficult for him? Yes. But he knew that the seed of God or, you know, that what he knows about God the Father, he knew that God will never leave him. He knew that God will always be there for him, right? Uh, and that's why he says to the woman, he says, he runs off and says, how can I go against my God? Right? Even in, in the way it works that he did, once he became uh, second in command, uh, he did it out of great reverence for God. And so God blessed him. And so later on uh, in his life, we see that what was sown in his life, he reaped the harvest of that. What the brothers sowed in their lives, thankfully, you know, even though they went through a difficult time, but because of Joseph, those people were saved. I love what he says, what you meant for evil, God turned it for good. So even as we sow, even as we water, the reaping is for you and me. And we may say, okay, I've shared the gospel with many people. Many of them have accepted the Lord. Many haven't. Where, where is my reaping? I don't see any reaping. I, I'm just, you know, just things are going just the same as it is. Now listen, the reaping is not something always that is natural, right? Now remember what Paul writes to uh, the Corinthians and to the Colossians. He says, you are my crown in heaven. The people, you are my crown, right? So yes, they, we will reap also in the natural, but our true reward will be in heaven where we will see these people. And uh, meaning uh, God will acknowledge us and honor us for the works that we have done. And that is the greatest joy, right? Uh, receiving honor from our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and then the fourth one, very important, consolidation. What is consolidation? Consolidation is basically process of making something stronger and more solid, right? Uh, so if we worked in IT companies or in your workplaces, you have teams, right? And you consolidate your team. You make your strong team, right? Uh, you you tell your team, hey, you know what? This this uh, financial year, we need to work hard. We need to come up with new ideas. We need to hit our targets. Uh, and you work towards getting a stronger team. And then you can look even for your personal life. You know, uh, you make, we can make resolutions in January. Usually all of us do that. You know, we make resolutions. Okay, God, I'm going to finish the Old Testament. I'm going to study the New Testament. I'm going to study eschatology and this and that. Right? So that's good. But consolidating what we have done is very important. Ministry as well. We need to make our teams, make teams, make strong teams. And only then we will be able to continue the work which God has given us. Right? I want to put forth two examples before we close on consolidating. The first example is an example which went wrong, a bad example of consolidating. The second example is a is a wonderful, powerful example of good consolidating, right? Okay, the first one. In the early 1900s, the Azusa Street Revival happened in England, right? It was a young man named William J. Seymour, a young man. He had about 15 people in his church, and then revival broke out in England, right? So what was started with about 15, 20 people suddenly in a few months became 500, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. And at one point of time, this small church, uh, this, this church was led by William J. Seymour. It was in the corner of a street. The name of the street was uh, Azusa Street, right? And it was the, the church was in a burnt out building, which had a ground floor. And on top, there was a church office. At the early 1900s. It could house only about, maybe about 300 to 400 people. But now revival has broken out and every day they had about 15,000 people coming in and going out into that place, a small street corner in England. So 
he did a wonderful thing, William J. Sabor. Many lives were touched. Many people were healed, deliverance, and all wonderful things. Right? He also formed a team of leaders. Right? But here's what happened. Even though he formed the team, he did not make that team strong. He did not consolidate. He didn't uh, you know, lead the team members in the right way. Right. And what happened? It was a big ministry now, all of a sudden, 15,000 odd people. So he was not able to raise up good leaders who could continue the work. So the, the leadership team, there was divisions among them, misunderstandings among them, financial misunderstandings, position misunderstandings. Some wanted to be a leader here, some wanted to be a leader there. And so what happened was, what started off so powerfully, in this side, the work, the ministry is so powerful, many lives being touched, transformed. On this side, the administration side, he could not really build a good team. And the sad thing is, after a couple of, I think it was a year or so, the whole thing died off. Picture this. The, the ministry teams, they had disagreements, arguments, and everyone went their own ways. People saw that, said, oh, there's division in the pastoral team or the ministry teams. So people slowly started, stopped coming. And by the end of this whole thing, in four years, what had 15,000 people, William J. Seymour continued to pastor that same church. Before he died, the church had 12 people sitting inside. What a sad story that was, right? But were lives touched? Yes. The entire England, people came from different cities and states, came there to be part of this revival. But the consolidation, the process of making the team stronger did not happen. And so it just went down. But he is still known as one of the greatest revivalists to have ever lived. Uh, because he did a wonderful work. Only if he had consolidated, had maybe uh, greater teams, bigger teams, taught them uh, you know, on leadership and all of this, maybe the, the revival could have stayed for a longer time and touched many, many more lives. Right? That was a, a bad example of how we, you know, of consolidation. Let's look at a good example. In the early 1990s, the Toronto revival happened. Right, uh, in Canada, in Toronto. And this young couple, uh, John and Carol are about uh, in Canada. They started a small church again, just maybe about 20, 30 people. And then all of a sudden, a move of God, hundreds of people started coming, thousands of people, many being touched, many being healed, many being delivered. Uh, but here's what he did, right? This couple, they're a pastor couple, what they did was they said, okay, now it looks like the church is growing exponentially. We need to form good, strong teams. And so they chose good leaders. They equipped those leaders. They had certain roles and responsibilities given to each of them. And he had people come in on staff, uh, paid staff in the church and many, many volunteers, many good leaders. And what he did was when he saw that there were about 500 to 1,000 people, he knew that there's going to be an exponential growth. So he consolidated what he had, right? So he formed many, many ministry teams and he would meet with these leaders. He would direct them, encourage them, strengthen them. And what this revival did, it went on for more than 10 years, right? And in this revival, new ministries were birthed. Heidi Baker's ministry was blessed by the Toronto revival. Uh, and then Nikki Gumbel's Alpha course uh, was founded through the Toronto revival. And so the Toronto revival went on to bless many ministries. It came a time that, you know, in Toronto, all the churches, every denomination, the churches were packed. Right, in the early 1900s, even though there was a lot of, you know, uh, work of the enemy happening, but the revival touched many, many, many lives. Churches were blessed. New ministries were formed. And it went on for many years. 
what what do we learn from that these two john and carol abbot they were able to consolidate form teams and and you know continue the work of god uh in the right way so even you and i we may be in ministry or we just may be ministering to few of them few of us friends or workplace uh colleagues consolidate what you have strengthen what you have it may be something that you yourself in your personal life reading of the word ministering uh prayer worship whatever it is consolidate don't be satisfied strengthen what god has blessed you with and use it for god's kingdom amen Amen. Right. Uh, so we've come to the end. Any questions? Any thoughts uh, uh, that any of you have? Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Right. I know that uh, the notes, as of now, uh, you will see in a couple of chapters as well. That notes, uh, you know, they are just pointers. So we're going to build on that. Right. So. Uh, so don't be alarmed with no notes in that so right any questions any thoughts uh, or we can close in prayer yes nicholson go ahead uh, hi pastor paul so i just wanted to know now practical aspects when uh, when the watering you're talking about the watering of people see this i think watering is where personally i feel that's where a lot of people struggle as well to follow up and things but now you know the current situation in karnataka where it is getting harder to even preach the gospel or even have a church open so uh, i like i mean the good things i like about it, i would say apc is you'll do media and other things but how practically uh, in the rural situation where we are we can't really do much so how do we apply this here in this current situation how do you water the people yeah yeah that's a wonderful question good question nicholson yes so firstly uh, uh in the administration side i think what is very important is especially you know what's happening in india where persecution and all of that is have your you know your documents right that's the like the basic thing right first thing have your documents your church documents have it ready have it with the, with you and have it ready now the reason i'm saying this is because uh somewhere in the outskirts of mangalore here uh, one of the churches or a prayer center was attacked and uh, you know they said you know you're like converting the first thing they asked is where is your license this pastor didn't have his license he just thought okay we're just doing a church and you know it's okay we will do it later on uh, it was a prayer center and so he didn't have a license so what happened he got into trouble and then the believers didn't know what to do and they were like okay what do we do now and so it was a, s- a small mistake uh so i, I i'm going to get to the your answer uh, nicholson but uh, the reason i'm saying this is because you have even as you're pastoring in rural settings uh there will be you, know, you said that you know there's there's no media not much of media uh follow up is going to be a challenge right but here's one thing you can you and i can do ministry in freedom right this freedom to minister to people right now say you know you you share the gospel with somebody now one thing that we must realize is that persecution will always happen to us as christians uh but one of the best ways is to have yourself right before man and before god and then you you know we we reach out we minister uh the watering the best way to do is you know even now especially during the season covid and you know persecution times one of the ways we can really minister to people which help me during the whole time of uh uh you know now this whole season of covid was uh, i personally called up families right uh, because we can't really you know a lot of our church folks don't know how to log into zoom and they're not they're all older couples and and some of them are come from rural setting so they don't know about zoom so personally calling here's the thing that's that's where it's going to be difficult right it there's a lot of time there's a lot of effort uh we need a lot of patience uh to go about doing this right uh, so i would say personally calling them 
talking to them, encouraging them. Hey, we, we, you know, there is persecution happening. You know, uh, this is what I did, you know, when the whole uh, thing came on the news and a lot of uh, church folks didn't come on Sunday. So I called them and I told them, I, I asked them, what happened? Why didn't you come on Sunday? They said, no, there's, you know, churches are being attacked. I said, that's all right. We have all our documents. We have everything right with us. And so there was a sense of freedom in their hearts as well. And then I was able to, you know, just the practical ministering of, you know, uh, giving them the word or just praying for them over the phone. Uh, that that was that is the most that we can do. So Nicholson, the in rural settings, I think this would be the best thing, you know, just calling them, talking to them uh, as, you know. Uh, but what I would say is don't be afraid also uh, of, uh, you know, persecutions and all of it. You just continue if you have planned any events and programs within the church, go ahead. Maybe, you know, you expect 50 people to come and only 10 people come. It's all right. Uh, but what will happen is slowly the church members will notice, hey, 10 of them are coming. So when we should go, we shouldn't be afraid. And and so that way you're, you know, you're building up the church. You're, the moment we say, okay, persecution. So even we will stop for some time, then, you know, it may have a bad effect on the church or, or not a bad effect. The church may think, okay, hey, even the pastors feel that we should not have church now. So, you know, that kind of feeling. So I feel that go ahead with every event that you have planned, you know, worship evening or Bible studies, whatever. Uh, even if it's few people, go ahead with it um, and continue that watering. And I'm sure that whole thing will touch other people. They will come. And, uh, I hope it's answered your question, Nicholson. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank yes, you so much. Time. Yes, yes, Divya, uh, I think you've raised your hand too, quickly. Yes. I think, Divya, this sound that's happening behind, uh, you want to share something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not from my side, yeah. I, I'm just asking the question. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, um, my question is like in terms of consolidation. Uh, so, what does it mean for in our personal life, like in our personally, as you were telling, to uh, you know consolidate the things that you are teach, uh, God is teaching. You. So, personally, yeah. uh, uh, in a practical way, what can I do? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll just share what uh, what I, I I meant by consolidating. Like for example, see, I finished my Bible college in two thousand and thirteen, right? Uh, thirteen. Uh, I finished the Bible, so I have done all these courses that we are teaching now. But consolidating is basically strengthening what you have already have, right? So, so what I do is I go back to my notes. I still use the notes that I studied back in two thousand and. Uh, 12, right? I still use those notes. I still make notes. I, I build on what I've learned, right? So for example, you know, uh, I used to, uh, when I was in Bible college, I started, I, I did eschatology. I didn't understand anything. Right? And I realized, oh man, I need to do so much more. I need to strengthen my, my whole thing. You know, I need to learn so much. There's so much more. So I went back and I would read and, you know, look at uh, commentaries, look at this, look at that. So basically what I was doing, what I'm doing is I'm strengthening my own spiritual walk with God. Right. So anything we do, uh, Livia, so it could be, uh, maybe you're reading the word of God, right? Uh, uh, here's what, one of the things I do. I, I take an epistle and I spend at least a month on one epistle. Right? So right now I was doing Romans, so spending a month only in Romans. Have I read Romans? Yes. Uh, do I know verses? From, yes. Can I, can we preach about, uh, can we preach sermons? Yes. But what I'm doing is I'm strengthening my understanding, my strengthening my, you know, belief system. I'm strengthening the whole, uh, it's not so that I can preach more sermons, but it's just that I'm building myself up. Right? I'm strengthening myself in the Lord. So personally, I, I believe that, you know, just spending that extra time with God uh, is consolidating uh, what you have, right? Uh, it will give you the strength to be a good minister 
uh, in the kingdom of God, right? Uh, remember, we spoke about this, uh, Divya, that, you know, uh, our, our, our uh, public life, our public ministry is an outflow of our personal life. So our personal life, our personal walk with God will reflect our public ministry. So strengthen what we have. We never come to a place where we feel that, okay, this is it, uh, you know, strengthen in whichever way we can. If we are in the pastoral section, if we are in the ministry, there's a lot of things that we have to strengthen. But if you're somebody who, uh, you know, working professional and, you know, just serving in the church, many things in our personal life, we can definitely, uh, you know, strengthen each one of us. You know, we as pastors also, we don't say, okay, we know everything. We go back to the word, we learn, we read it every day. We strengthen what we have. So, so yes, Devi, I hope that answers your question too. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I know it's past our time. Have a great week ahead. We will catch up next week. God bless you all. God bless. Bye-bye.